Walker writes in, does ESPN brass listen to this show? They can't. How could this possibly continue in a prime spot for this long? It's just truly awful radio. <laughs> Only on Tuesday. We're hoping <laughs> every Tuesday, every Tuesday. But don't, please don't tell ESPN brass that Cody is here just to ask questions about his fantasy team. <laughs> so the general manager of the Giants today had to be at the press conference for Tom Coughlin, and this is what he actually said about Jason Pierre-Paul. The Jason Pierre-Paul situation, that's unfortunate, but some of those things happen sometimes, and that's just the way it is. But you got to play the hand you're dealt. <laughs> Jerry Reese. That is Jerry Reese, the general manager of the Giants, uh, with some interesting phrasing at the end of this soundbite. The Jason Pierre-Paul situation. That's unfortunate, but some of those things happen sometimes, and that's just the way it is. But you got to play the hand you're dealt. There's a single person in the Giants organization that didn't wince when he said that. A single person. I think it's such an ingrained cliche that people probably didn't even notice it. Oh, you had to notice it. No. You got to play the hand that you're dealt. Ouch. <laughs> Cody, you've contributed a lot so far to this segment. Are, are you still yeah. reveling in how much you ruined the last one? Like, right. what's happening? Yes, I here? am. As okay, a matter of fact. Because you've, like, what? Right. I'm looking at you, and that yeah. microphone well, in front of your face is well, so that you me. can talk. You're proud of your work. With and, 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 like, <laughs> are you going to contribute? You're, I know you're just looking at the clock right. afraid. No, what, I know. No, clock? no, Wait, I know. I already saw you. What I'm clock? on to you. So you're just afraid? Is that what you're doing? You're no, going to contribute I'm, nothing to this segment. What do you want? What do you need from Something me? more than, ouch. Yeah, can something more a, than a whispered ouch away from the microphone. Can I give you a quick fact that will interest people? Anybody remember the late 60s singer Oliver? He had a couple of hits, including Good Morning, Starshine, that guy. He is the brother of ACC Commissioner John Swafford. Now. Wow. <laughs> I mean, now who didn't contribute? Oh, you saved the show. <laughs> now who didn't contribute? How are you so bad? This was the Don Levatar Show on ESPN Radio. You've upgraded from your old flip phone and that old dinosaur of a TV, not to mention the fax machine. But what about that old car, truck, or SUV in your driveway? It's time to get into the new with Ford. New is Ford, America's best-selling brand. Because new is the power and performance of available EcoBoost engine technology. New is an available 180-degree front camera that lets you see around corners. New can practically park itself with available active park assist. New is an available hands-free foot-activated lift gate that'll give you a hand when yours are full. And new is a bird's eye view of your truck from an available 360-degree camera. So get into the new with Ford. Visit your local Ford dealer or go to Ford.com for current offers. Sales claim based on 2015 calendar year sales, January through November. ESPN Radio, on demand, the Hockey Today podcast. And if you talk to players now and the way that this whole, uh, the outdoor games have evolved, I think players love it. I think the fans do, and I certainly do. And you talk to any player, you talk to any formal player. We all play hockey. We understand what it's like. You know, as a kid, you're outdoors, you're on the pond. The Hockey Today Podcast. Listen to it now on ESPNRadio.com. The College Football Playoff National Championship. Heisman winner Derrick Henry and the Crimson Tide are rolling towards another title. Alabama emphatic and dominant. Up against the Crimson Tigers. Still undefeated. Who are looking to put a perfect season in the history books. The National Championship presented by AT&T, Alabama, Clemson. Monday at 8.30 Eastern on ESPN. And streaming live on Watch ESPN and the ESPN app. Coming up on the Paul Feinbaum Show, Tom Rinaldi has a live report from Tuscaloosa as Nick Saban and Alabama prep for another title shot. The Paul Feinbaum Show, Tuesday on the ESPN Radio app and the SEC Network. The NBA on ESPN. 
This is your game. The biggest names in the game take the court for a Friday night doubleheader. First, LeBron leads the Cavs in a matchup with the T-Wolves. Then, KD and the Thunder head to L.A. for a showdown with Kobe and the Lakers. Cavs-Wolves at 8 Eastern, Thunder-Lakers at 1030. Friday on ESPN and streaming live on Watch ESPN and the ESPN app. Presented by State Farm. It's the College Football Playoff National Championship. Clemson and Alabama. And we're live from Phoenix, Arizona at the Deuce. Coverage starts at 6 Eastern Monday on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. Saturday, the NFL playoffs start on ESPN and ABC. The Cinderella Chiefs have won 10 straight. Touchdown, Macklin! Now KC looks to continue their magical run into the postseason as they face J.J. Watt and the AFC South Division champion, Texas. It's a matter of time before J.J. Watt makes his presence felt. The NFL wildcard playoffs. Chiefs, Texans at 420 Eastern, Saturday on ESPN and ABC. ESPN Radio counts down to football's golden game. 33 days. And counting, Trent Dilfer. Being out on the field before the game and all the pre-game festivities and then when the planes go over, that's kind of when you realize, wow, uh, I'm doing this and the hair stands up on your arm and yet you understand that you're in something that's way bigger than you and you get to do it with your boys. For more Golden Game coverage, stay tuned to ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. X Games Aspen. Experience winter's premier action snow sports and music festival live. Oh my goodness! The world's most talented athletes take on the mountaintop and a stellar music lineup featuring Dead Mouse, DJ Snake, Kygo, Nas, Run the Jewels, and 21 Pilots. Rock buttermilk like never before. This lineup is no joke. Crash the party at X Games Aspen, January 28th through 31st. Get tickets now at xgames.com. The Clemson Tigers. They have run the table throughout the entire regular season. They've got maybe the best quarterback in the country in Deshaun Watson. The Alabama Crimson Tide. Alabama's got the best front seven in America. Alabama's got the best defense in America. A college football playoff national championship presented by AT&T. We're setting ourselves up for a classic national championship. Coverage begins Monday, January 11th at 7 Eastern on ESPN and on ESPN Radio. You're locked into the home of Southeast Missouri State Baseball. Hey! This is ESPN Radio 1220. KGIR, Cape Girardeau. ESPN Radio Sports Center. I'm Bob Picozzi. The search will include interviews with the team's offense coordinator, Ben McAdoo, and defense coordinator, Steve Spagnolo. Giants co-owner John Maris said this morning there is no timetable to hire a successor to Tom Coughlin, who stepped down yesterday after 12 seasons and two Super Bowl titles. At age 69, is Coughlin retiring? I didn't say that. I just said I'm necessar- not necessarily done with coaching. I will. Somehow, some way, I will. But my wife will not want me to be home longer than probably 48 hours. Here's your coat. You know, don't you have some place to go? Mara said today that Coughlin's departure was, quote, more mutual than anything. A cast has been removed from the right hand of Bengals quarterback Andy Dalton. According to ESPN's Bob Holtzman, Dalton has missed three games with a broken thumb. His status for Saturday's wildcard playoff game against Pittsburgh is unknown. Quarterback Kyle Allen, who announced last month that he was leaving Texas A&M, will transfer to Houston. This according to the Houston Chronicle. He may be just a freshman, but LSU's Ben Simmons is first in the SEC in rebounding, third in scoring, fifth in assists. The Tigers beat Kentucky tonight, 9 Eastern on ESPN. Like burgers, like chicken, then you'll love the new flame-grilled chicken burger from Burger King. A flame-grilled chicken patty topped with veggies on a toasted bun. And right now, they're just two for $5. The new flame-grilled chicken burger only at Burger King. Limited time only. Price and participation vary. This is Mike Greenberg for the best in local sports talk and play-by-play. It's from Southeast Missouri's ESPN Radio Network. I'm Eric Sean. This Sports Center update is brought to you by Bertrand Law Firm. Visit TreyBertrand.com. The losing streak continues for the St. Louis Blues, who dropped their third straight 
to struggling Ottawa 3-2 in overtime at Scott Trade. The Senators had lost seven straight road games before last night. Fourth loss in five games for the Notes, who's been outscored 13-4 to in those four losses. Brian Elliott suffered the defeating goal. Elliott has just one win in his last seven starts. Troy Brower, Kevin Shattenkirk, he scored for the Blues, who started a three-game road trip in Colorado tomorrow night. The St. Louis Rams have wrapped up their latest losing season. They finished at 7-9 and nine after Sunday's overtime loss in San Francisco. And head coach Jeff Fisher's four seasons in St. Louis, he is yet to post a winning record, 27-36-1 in the history of the NFL. He would become just the third ever coach to be given a fifth year at the helm after four straight losing seasons. By the way, the other two coaches were fired in season five. He has one year left on his five-year $35 million contract. The SEMO basketball teams will log 742 miles on the bus this week with road games at Moorhead State on Thursday in Eastern Kentucky Saturday. Get sports center updates every hour on Southeast Missouri's ESPN 92.9 FM and 1220 AM. You're grilling for everyone on game day, and people are hungry. More than that, they're hangry, and it's 95 degrees out, and they're thirsty. That's right. People are thrangry. They need to chill, and that gives you an idea. You remember Coors Light is filtered and bottled cold, so you pass some cold ones out. Suddenly, it's like they're snowboarding in the majestic Rocky Mountains, speeding away from the peaks of thrangry and down the slopes of all oh, yes. So they make with the cheering and let you get with the grilling. Well done. Now it's time for your Coors Light. <sighs> Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. Great beer, great responsibility. The conversation has been growing about Wings Etc. See, Wings Etc. has those award-winning jumbo wings. They're popular for both dine-in and carry-out. Now the word is getting out about Wings Etc.'s appetizer lineup. From the ultimate nachos to the deep-fried pickle spears, frankly, they're irresistible. Friends are sharing time together at Wings Etc. They've got dining rooms filled with HD TVs tuned to the best sports programming, including NFL Sunday Ticket. The people at the next table are talking about Wings Etc.'s daily half-pound lunch special, starting at just $6.49. Plus, Wings Etc. has food and drink specials throughout the week, including 59-cent wings every Monday. Plus, there's the kids' menu, and Wings Etc. is family-friendly with video games in the dining room. <laughs> and the whole community is excited about how Wings Etc. is locally owned and operated, and they're proud to support local athletes, their families, schools, and teams. I guess Wings Etc. is a really big deal around here. There are lots of reasons to love the holidays. And now, during the Ford Holiday Sales Event, America's best-selling brand is giving you more. Big holiday savings on amazing vehicles, including built for tough trucks, cars that thrill by design, and SUVs that will help you be unstoppable. All with the technology, performance, and style you'll love. So don't miss the Ford Holiday Sales Event. Hurry to your Ford dealer for the best gift ever. Claim based on 2014 calendar year sales data. And now, your ESPN Radio Network local local weather forecast. The National Weather Service calling for sunshine. A high of 41 today will dip to 27 tonight under clear skies. 44 sunshine tomorrow, then showers likely Thursday afternoon with a high of 46. More rain likely Thursday night, lingering into Friday with a high of 53. Saturday, another chance of rain and a high of 50. And right now, Sunday, partly sunny and only 30. Boy, you're up to date with the latest weather forecast. Breaking on the ESPN Radio Network. This is Mike Golick for the best in local sports talk and play-by-play. -play. It's SEMO ESPN. This is a proud presentation of Mississippi River Radio Sports, the sports authority. Check this out right here. It's time now for the Red Hawks Coaches Show on the SEMO ESPN Radio Sports Network. The Southeast Coaches Show airs every Tuesday at noon on ESPN 92.9 FM and 12.20 AM from Wings, etc. in Cape and Jackson. This is your chance to delve deep into the Red Hawks basketball season with head coach Rick Ray. So what do you say? Come on, let's go! Let's go! Go! Let's go live to Wings, etc. on SEMO ESPN. <laughs> Welcome in. It is another edition of the Colfeld Distributing Red Hawks Coaches Show. Coach Rick Ray is here. We are at our Jackson location, Wings, etc. So we invite you to come by. We'll be here until 1 o'clock, but you can hang out a little later than that. Uh, if you want to join us for lunch, and we suggest their award-winning jumbo wings, both dine-in and carry-out, maybe you're on the go. Just stop in, pick them up, take them with you, or you can sit down and enjoy lunch with us. Their menu includes 
their freshly made burgers, their subs, wraps, quesadillas, entree salads. They have smoked ribs here at Wings, and their appetizer lineup includes their ultimate nachos. And if you have not tried this, the spicy deep-fried pickle spears. You'll notice as soon as you walk in, they've got the high-def televisions. They've always got the best sports programming in town, and that includes the NFL Sunday ticket. So the playoffs start this week. Wings is your headquarters to watch NFL playoff football. We welcome you in, and uh, Coach Rick Ray is here. We will talk with Red Hawks junior forward Joel Angus. He will join us. He is the 11th leading rebounder in the Ohio Valley Conference, coming off a double-double against Tennessee State on Saturday night. We'll talk with Joel coming up. Uh, we'll recap the Red Hawks' uh, two conference games against Belmont and Tennessee State. They head out on the uh, the Death Valley Tour is what they call it, Coach Ray, uh, Moorhead State and Eastern Kentucky. So the it's a long bus ride, over six hours to get to, to Moorhead, Kentucky. It's a short trip over to Richmond, but uh, these are going to be two tough road games coming up. Yeah, there's no question about it. And I think what you're going to see is, is two totally different opposing teams. Uh, Moorhead State is a very physical team. Um, they're going to ride you off of cuts. They're going to really be more similar to Tennessee State, where we just got through playing, um, but even more physical. And then when you play at Eastern Kentucky team, you're going to see a high-scoring team, team that spreads you out, real similar to Belmont in their three-point proficiency. Shoot, uh, the top two three-point shooting teams in the league, Belmont, Eastern Kentucky. Yeah, and they, they not only do they shoot it well, they shoot it from different positions. So it's similar to Belmont where they'll have a skill of four out there they can shoot. They'll have four guys out there for the most part that can always shoot the three. Sean Woods, the head coach at Moorhead State, do you remember him when he was at the University of Kentucky playing for Rick Pitino? Yeah, I know Sean for a long time. Uh, our older guys, when we go to the Final Four for our coaches' convention, we used to get together and play basketball all the time. And we play pickup basketball, and Sean was still playing at that point in time. So, you know, he's taken on – that team has taken on the personality of Sean. Sean was a tough, hard-nosed uh, point guard, and their team plays that way where they get out and they really pressure you. They pick up and do some of the Rick Patino things as far as like running and jumping in full court. Um, so he's really done a good job with that team as far as like their toughness is their identity. Uh, one of the claims to fame for Sean Woods, uh, you know, one of the most famous college basketball games of all time is the Christian Leitner game when Duke beat Kentucky in the regional semifinals. And the reason they needed the miracle shot by Leitner was because Sean Woods hit a running bank shot with about with 2.1 seconds to go. It looked like that was sending Kentucky to the national champ or to the yeah to the national championship game, but instead Leitner made the shot. Or we might still be talking about Sean Woods. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. Grant Hill makes that inbound pass uh, to Christian Leitner, and he hits that turnaround last-second jump shot. But if that doesn't happen, then we're still talking about Sean Woods as far as like being the hero because you're exactly right. He hit the point um, to actually bring them to that point where they had to come in and score in order to win that basketball game. But Sean was a really good basketball player. But it's amazing just one turn of events how it affects our, our the history. You know, uh, of the coaches in the Ohio Valley Conference, uh, the guys that just look mean, that look intimidating. Sean Woods is there. James Green at Jacksonville State. Man, that guy looked like he played college linebacker. Uh, but two disciplinarian type coaches, and you'll see more head state coming up on Thursday night. We'll talk more about that. want to recap uh, the two games you had at the Show Me Center. The game against Belmont on Thursday, 92-82. to 82. Uh, They hit 17 threes. You hit 10 threes. Uh, that was one of your best offensive performances, I thought, of the season. Well, you know, the thing that we stress to our guys going into that game is if you want to have a chance to win against a team like Belmont, you must match their confidence on the offensive end. Uh, Belmont's a very confident basketball team, and if you don't go out there with some moxie about yourself on the offensive end, then you're going to struggle because the thing you have to realize against Belmont, you may hold them down some, but they're going to score points. I mean, that's just what they're built on. They're built on making sure they score points points and you know Rick Bird doesn't do anything as far as like not recruiting anybody that can't shoot the basketball so you know I wanted our guys to go out there with extreme amount of confidence in their own individual game and I thought our guys did a really good job of exposing some of their defensive uh, deficiencies and exploiting some of those things. What would you contrast the defensive skills of Tennessee State who came in number one in the league in field goal percent defense and Belmont, who actually came in at number two in field goal percent defense, 
but different mentalities on that end of the floor. Yeah, I think Belmont is a team that forces you to make jump shots. They they pack it in. Um, they don't get out into passing lanes. Um, so everything is like based on you taking jump shots. Whereas a team against Tennessee State, they're going to get out and pressure you and be real physical. And what you have to do is you have to get paint touches against them because they're not going to allow you to be comfortable on the perimeter. So I think the two different things as far as like the philosophy, whereas – Belmont wants to keep you in front of them, and Tennessee State wants to pressure you and be physical. Boy, one of the guys who has really stepped up lately four straight double-digit scoring games, including 15 points. He hit three three three-pointers in the game against Belmont, and that's Eric McGill. Are you seeing a step forward for him from where he was early in the season, true freshman, to where he is now, a guy that looks like he's playing with a little more confidence? Yeah, there's no question about it. The development and the maturation process for Eric McGill has really been good for our program. And, you know, he's stepping into a situation where we're not sure if he's going to play the point, if he's going to play the two, whether he's a combo. Um, But uh, I think with Eric McGill, what he is, is he just a good guard. You can put him in any one of those scenarios as far as like running the team or being a guy who's off the ball as well, too. But the thing we tried to pound into Eric was that he had to be much more aggressive. I think he's such an unselfish kid that and with him being aggressive, he's still going to make the right pass and the right play. And the physicality of the game sometimes gets to him like all freshmen. He needs one more offseason of getting bigger and stronger, and he'll do that this offseason. Um, but I think what you're starting to see is a guy that can really score the basketball for us, that can make plays for us. And, and I, I'd be surprised if he doesn't end up being on the all-OVC freshman team with the performances that he's starting to put together. Well, he's already got one OVC Freshman of the Week award. Uh, and he has gone six for his last 11 from three-point range. Early in the season, you know, I didn't classify him as a shooter. You didn't really see anything that said shooter. The last few games, he's looking more like a shooter. Yeah, especially at the free-throw line. He's really struggled at the free-throw line, so you wouldn't classify him as being a shooter. But, you know, in OVC play right now, he's shooting 55% from the three-point line, and uh, we've been working with him as far as, like, his free-throw form. He's a guy that's going to end up being a make free-throws. He puts too much arc. On his free throw, we were talking about skyscraper. That. Yeah, it just goes way up. There's and so more we, margin for error. It seems like if if it's too high, right? Yes, yeah, no question about it. So we've been really focusing on him shooting out on his free throw and putting a lot of spin on his ball rather than just shooting up so high. So you know, this is something. Everything about the way you play is habits. And, and so we're not going to see a change in his free throw shooting in the first couple games that he make this uh, change at the free throw form. But what will happen is it will become a habit for him, and once you force those habits, he'll start becoming a better free throw shooter for us. You know, I know it is a small sample size, so I'll preface, preface it with that. But at the same time, uh, in your non-conference schedule, non-conference season, you average 65 points scored per game. You would like to see it better. The last two conference games, again, just two games, but against two of the better teams in the league, the two teams with the most wins, Belmont and Tennessee State, you're averaging 74 points per game in conference play. We are certainly seeing the offense take the step. Yeah, and I think anytime you come in and you institute a new offensive scheme, especially with the motion offense, the hard part about motion as a coach it takes the control of the game away from you. You know, most coaches want to have that control where they're running the set or they're doing something where they know that the ball is going to be in a particular person's hands. And I think the beautiful thing about motion is it gives the players freedom to go make plays. Um, so they're starting to figure out their way as far as like them being effective in the motion offense, where they can score from, where they can drive the ball from. And so now I think our biggest step and biggest strides that we've made as a team is our willingness to share the basketball. You know, you never want to have it where you pass the basketball and you don't think you're going to get the basketball back. That's the worst feeling you can have on the court. But I think our guys are starting to figure out if they reverse the basketball, if they share the basketball, is a pretty good chance that they're going to end up back with the basketball. And that doesn't preclude you from, I'm sure there are times in certain scenarios where you'll draw up a design play where it's not motion. You're, you're going to draw up something. For instance, out-of-bounds plays, we've seen several that you've drawn up that have been successful. Yeah, we'd like to make sure that we still have some sets 
we're trying to focus in on some of the deficiencies that a team may have, or you're trying to isolate somebody in the post, or you're trying to get a drive against somebody, or there may be somebody on their team that you're trying to get in foul trouble. So you're trying to put them in a drive, dribble drive situation. So there's still different scenarios, but you know, I told my team, I don't like them looking at me on the offensive end. I want them just to come down and just run motion and play freely. So the next time uh, that you yell out at a player from the sideline and he doesn't acknowledge you, that's okay. <laughs> no, on the offensive end. <laughs> I got it. All right. Now, as far as the Tennessee State game, I mean, it was right there. I mean, it was right there. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on teams knowing how to win and learning how to win. You haven't had a lot of wins here early on, a couple. Uh, that game was there. You're up by four points with 343 left, but you're playing a team now that has 10 wins and has learned how to win. They finished in the basement last year. They have turned it around this year. They've got some transfers, you know, second year under Dana Ford. They are starting to run his system. Uh, when they finished last, they had only had one player back from the previous year's team. So he was starting from scratch. You understand what that's like. So when you're talking about Tennessee State, was that a case of a team that knew how to win a little bit more than a team that's learning how to win there in that final three minutes and uh, three minutes, 43 seconds? Well, I think you could characterize it that way. But I, I think what we need to focus in on is, is like when everybody looks at the down the stretch of the game, we were up four points. There was about three minutes and 41 seconds left in that game. Everybody focuses in on that last four minutes of the basketball game. But truth be told, we lost that game in the first 36 minutes of the basketball game. You know, I told our, our team before we watched taped um, the other day when we watched the Tennessee State game, I said, we're going to kick ourselves because we're going to see so many points that we left on the board, whether it be because we didn't finish on the offensive end or we had some breakdowns defensively that were really fixable errors. And so if we concentrate on some of these little things throughout the first 36 minutes of the game, we would even be in this position in the last four minutes of the game. So, you know, I just think that we have some some errors that are very fixable that we got to understand that we're making throughout the course of the game. And, and the numbers say you're making progress uh, from the free throw line. I mean, uh, that, that has been an issue early on in the season. Non-conference play 56%, but in your conference games, 67 percent so we're starting to see that trend in the right direction yeah and especially when you're in a situation where you're down to an opposing team the best way to get back into the ball game is with the clock stop and you're shooting free throws i mean it's the right. best opportunity for you to get back into a basketball game and for us we were getting to the free throw line in those situations, but we weren't converting at the free throw line. So we would get to a situation where we're at the free throw line, um, the clock is stopped, and we got a chance to like cut the lead from six to four or cut the lead from four to two, and we would come out of there with nothing, especially when you're shooting the front end of the one and one. Those are the ones Those that are killer. the killer. Yeah. You know, so and also a situation I work I worked for at Indiana State, he'd always say when you had an opportunity to finish at the rim. And so then you'd go and you didn't finish at the rim and you missed your first free throw. He said, well, we had an opportunity for three. Now we only got an opportunity for one. And, and so those are the things that are killers. And so that free throw line is really, really important. And uh, one of your better free throw shooters this year has been uh, Joel Angus. He's up over 70 percent. He has been a guy that's been pretty reliable. In fact, so reliable in your mind when a technical foul was called the other night. That's the guy you chose to go shoot the free throws. Yeah, it's probably the first time ever in the history of college basketball you sent a power forward uh, to go shoot technicals uh, for your team. But uh, he, Joel's a guy that's come in and really worked on his shot. Um, there are some things that we worked with with him individually. But, you know, we only have that two hours uh, in the offseason that we can work with our guys throughout the week. So what we do in those two hours really doesn't mean anything. If that young man doesn't go work on his own individual game, take what we teach him and go do it on his own. And, and I can say that Joel, not just because he's sitting here, um, but to, he's a guy that really worked on his game on his own. And so you can see that improvement in his jump shot. It's interesting. His jump shot is a different looking jump shot. When a guy has a different type of form, how – much do you evaluate wait we're going to do a total overhaul or we're going to go with his form but just tweak a couple of things because at this stage of his career i would say 
well, you can't really overhaul a guy's jump shot for him, right? Well, well you're being kind, Eric, when you say it was a different looking shot. <laughs> um, he, he's really improved on If you would have saw it before we started playing, it, it was something different. It was kind of a mixture between like a Bill Cartwright with a hitch. In it. So um, he, right. he, he's a guy that's really worked on it. But, you know, what you want to do is you want to give them something that they can kind of hang their hat on. You know, you don't want to give them too many things without their thinking, uh, but you want to give them something that just changes. And what we tried to do with him, was just one motion. Uh, I thought he had like two different motions. He he'd stop at the beginning of his shot, and then when he get to the top of his shot, he'd stop as well too. So what we tried to do is just smooth out his motion, and then focusing on finishing high. So he's done that, and the shot looks a lot better. And you can see the fact that he's making 15 footers, 17 footers out there, but he's also making his free throws too. And he's shooting 46 percent from the field and a lot of that is the the mid-range jump shot that that is going to bring a defender away from the basket that's a plus right yeah and especially in our motion offense because you're going to be in so many different places so if you're a guy that's on a perimeter and they're not guarding you it's like playing five on four and, and so we need to make sure that our guys can make that 15 to 17 foot shot ideally we like to have some guys out there that can make some threes from that front court position too but that's something we'll have to grow into but i, I think joel is a threat from 15 feet and we got some other guys in the front court that we're trying to grow into being perimeter threats now we've got a couple of front court players that it appears to me that the think they're three-point shooters and tony anderson and Jalen stewart well, I think you might have a little talk with Tony. We've had our talks with Tony about, like, you know, reality and perception. And, and, and the reality is what the statistics point out to us. And so, you know, he's got to be a young man that understands, like, he can make uncontested threes. Um, but uh, I think some of the shots that he's taken are contested. So, you know, we show our guys the stats. If you're an NBA basketball player, which are the best players in America, the best players in the world, when they, they shoot 55% from the field when they take uncontested shots. Um, but when they take contested shots, they shoot 39%. Um, so the goal for you should be not to take contested jump shots. And so sometimes Tony takes those contested jump shots, but if he's wide open, he should take those shots and he's in rhythm. But we want to make sure that we build our offense from the inside out. Um, so, And that's the one thing we got to focus in on all our players, not just you know our bigs. You know, We want our guards to be able to score around the basket with penetration. A guy like Antonius Cleveland can score with his back to the basket in the paint. So we got to make sure we get Tony in and then get him out. And when you talk about uh, elevating your three-point percentage, uh, it's helped that uh, Isaiah Jones has started to come on. Uh, you know, he's now top 10 in the league and made three-pointers. We mentioned all of a sudden Eric McGill, six for his last 11 from three. You get Jamal Calvin, a true shooter back. Non-conference play, you shot 27% from behind the arc. OVC play. 39%. That's a respectable number. Yeah, well, with Hoopy, I mean, he's going to come out of the slump because he's going to keep shooting. I mean, there's there's no ifs, ands, and buts about that. Um, but, you know, what we try to focus in on Hoopy, once again, is just like the quality of shot that you're taking. And we put in a couple things where he has an opportunity to kind of, you know, scratch that itch a little bit by putting in a set play for him that specifically sets something up for him to get a three-point shot. So hopefully we get him open there. Um, but I think definitely Jamal Calvin being back in the mix is huge for us because he's a guy that can stretch the defense with his three-point ability. And I think he's a more than a reliable three-point shooter. And then Eric has started to make some three-pointers as well, too, for us. So, you know, but I think more so than anything, when it's all said and done, it's the quality of our three-point attempts that's improved. Coach Rick Ray is our guest. We're at Wings, etc. in Jackson. It is the Colfeld Distributing Red Hawks Coaches Show with Coach Rick Ray. And you talk about uh, Isaiah Jones. Uh, this is a guy that uh, is showing you that he can take the ball to the basket. We know about his shooting prowess. You commented after the game uh, against Tennessee State. He did not make a three in that game. And you were commenting on setting screens hard and different ways for him to get the basketball. And when you see situations like that where maybe some things aren't opening up for him, is that when you go to the sideline and say, hey, we're going to run a couple of specific plays for him, see if we can get him going? Yeah, and, and what I was ex to expound on that, uh, the best way for a good shooter to get open is to actually set a good screen. 
um, we call it second action. So if he can set a screen where he's taking someone to the basket, you know, that defender that's guarding Hoopy has a choice to make. Does he open up and try to take away that layup because Hoopy set a good screen to take someone to the basket? Or does he stay tight to him? So now it helps our offense because if he opens up and takes away that layup, now Hoopy can come off a second screen and he'll be open. But if that guy chooses to stay tight to Hoopy because he can shoot the basketball, then the guy coming off the cut, has a chance to be open. So, you know, what we focus in on is like, Hooper, you have to be an effective screener in order for you to get open. But if you don't become an effective screener, then you're never going to be open because it's pretty easy these days to stay tight to guys and just stay on top of them. All right. Uh, Belmont uh, is for real. Uh, let's face it, seven of the last 10 years they've gone to the NCAA tournament. Uh, since 2006, they have won 14 conference championships. That's regular season and, and tournament. The only teams in America who have won more conference titles over that time, Gonzaga and Kansas. That's it. So, you know, this is a team that is going to be right there in the mix. We know they're for real. We saw them. Tennessee State, a team that finished last last year, now is 10-4. and four. You saw them up close. They very easily could have beaten Tennessee. I think they had them down seven at halftime, uh, you know, in Knoxville. Uh, is this a team, after you saw them on Saturday, do you think they are a team that could challenge for a top spot? Well, I think most definitely. If, if you sit there and you watch that game against Tennessee and you saw them battle against a Tennessee team that has SEC athletes, you know, you walk away from that very impressed um, with the fact that they have the athletes that compete at any level. And I, I think that's what sets them apart right now is that at every position, they're very athletic. They're very tough, and they have tall guards. Um, you know, most people in, in our league have guards that are, you know, six one, six foot. You know, but they have a uh, starting point guard to six five. They got another guard to six four or six five. Um, so they have some length at their guard positions. But you know, I think the thing that sets them apart right now is just their willing willingness to be tough, their willingness to grind it out, and their willingness to defend. So, you know, I think, I'd think i be surprised if they don't end up towards the top of the conference. You know, one thing uh, I was impressed with, uh, you really contained uh, their second leading scorer and uh, the second leading rebounder in the league, Wayne Martin. Three points, six rebounds. He did not make a field goal in the basketball game. He did a nice job holding him down. Yeah, and, and that's part of the, you know, the zone. Um, the zone against a dominant post player, it kind of takes them out of things if you if you work it right. Um, but our center, our five man, which ends up being Trey Kellum and Tony Anderson, they have to do a great job of staying on top because there's built in help all the time in that zone. And so most people don't feel comfortable making post feeds. Um, but it's twofold. If you're trying to take away a good post player, it's got to be the post guy that's a willing defender. But it also has to be a situation where the guy that has the ball, he's getting pressured. And most times when guys are getting pressured, they won't sit there and fight that pressure to look for a post guy. They just want to get the ball out of the hands or they start to drive the ball. Well, their uh, leading scorer, Karanda Shields, uh, fifth-year senior, went to two NCAA tournaments at Montana before transferring. Uh, I think he played in 88 games at Montana. A veteran guy. He's a real good player. This will be the only year he plays at Tennessee State, but he is a really – looks to me like he's a difference maker. Yeah, to me, you know, anytime you have somebody that not only can shoot the basketball but also is the same threat as far as putting the ball on the deck and making plays, then you got a problem. And I think that's what he is. He's a guy that's more than capable of three-point shooter, but he's also a guy that's more than willing to put the ball on the deck and go make plays too. So, you know, he's a guy that you got to close out to to take away shot but you also can't close out to him too close to him because he's more than able to drive by and make plays we'll talk about Moorhead State and Eastern Kentucky coming up we're going to talk with uh, Joel Angus in just a couple of moments but I wanted to ask you uh, how about that uh, Kansas Oklahoma game last night triple overtime as a basketball head coach I bet you enjoyed watching a game like that that's that's one of the better college basketball games in the regular season non-tournament game I've seen in a while yeah, I flipped on the game. I was watching Moorhead State, but, you know, you couldn't help but to stop watching Moorhead State and watch some of those things. So I started watching Moorhead State as far as, like, the intermissions, timeouts, and things like that. But what a phenomenal basketball game. And it's what you want when you have number one versus number two. Um, obviously, Bill Self has done an unbelievable job at Kansas. I think they've won with 12 straight uh, Big 12, Big 8. Big 12 championships, right. and then Lon Kruger, who's a coach at every level, NBA, college, and had a lot of success. But, boy, you know, Buddy Heald 
It was a guy who was lightly recruited. To see him now be a guy who's probably going to end up being in the conversation or should be player of the year and go out there. And the reason he said he wanted to come back to Oklahoma is that he never wanted Allen Fieldhouse. And so to see him go out there and compete like that and have an opportunity to fulfill his dream, the reason he came back to Oklahoma for his senior year and see him out there doing that, it was really a phenomenal atmosphere and phenomenal game. And then what about at the end of the game where they give the Kansas, you know, Jayhawk fans at Allen Fieldhouse, give him a standing ovation after his radio interview because they appreciated the effort that he put into that game. Pretty impressive. Uh, for those who didn't see it, Buddy Heald had – 46 points, the most points ever scored by an opponent at Fog Island Fieldhouse ever in the history of Kansas basketball. I, that's pretty impressive. I had no idea that. I knew he scored the 46 points, but I didn't know it was the most ever in Allen Fieldhouse history. That's, you know, for, you, for an opponent. Yeah, you talk about like the, the teams that have come through there, and for him to have that stat is unbelievable. And at the end of the basketball game, there was a lot of controversy because Buddy Heald was inbounding the ball. I think they were under 20 seconds to go in the third overtime, and there isn't much room on that Fog Allen uh, Fieldhouse sideline, and the Kansas defender was all over him, and at one point, replay show actually touched his arm as he was trying to inbound the ball. He deflected it, stole it, got fouled, hit the free throws. That was the decisive play in the game, and it certainly appeared that the officials probably should have called a situation there where he wasn't giving them the proper space, and, and they very easily could have called something there on uh, Kansas. Well, let's let's be frank here. Like, there's not a lot of room on the sideline by design, you know, for, <laughs> to give them a, an advantage there. Um, but most uh, officials and referees, what they'll do is. Even though, like, their sideline is there, they'll tell that defender who's guarding the ball on the inbounds, they give them more cushion so they make sure they don't break the plane. There's supposedly a, a plane that goes upward, okay, and it's and goes up infinitive, okay? But what they're not supposed to be able to do is break that plane, and it's clear to me um, that the defender broke the plane and defending an out-of-bounds play. How would Rick Ray have reacted in that situation? <laughs> well, first of all, you, you don't want to be in that situation where you're trying to get the ball in bounds like that in order to score. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing you have to be careful for as a coach, you don't want to do anything additional to take your team away from having a chance to win the basketball game. So, you know, obviously Lon Kruger can, you know, voice his displeasure um, with the fact there was a non-call. But what you don't want to do is go over the lines and now get yourself a technical and take your team from having a chance to still win the basketball game. To me, that's the most important thing. You don't want to do anything to take away from your kids having a chance to win. And I think if you go overboard and you end up getting a technical in that situation, now you have zero chance to win that game. Where if you go down and you foul and you free throw, you still have a chance. The chance is slim, but you still have a chance to still win the basketball game or take it to overtime. Did you see Bill Self get hit with his technical right before halftime? It was a play right in front of Self, right in front of the bench. And one of their players went in and swiped the ball away from an Oklahoma player and replay showed it was all ball. There was no contact, but a foul was called. And so that, that's about as hot as I've seen Bill Self. He got a pretty quick tee in a situation like that. Well, I thought if you look at it, it was pretty effective as the way the fouls were called in the second half compared to the first half. I think if you, I think they were at home. They only went to the free throw line two times at home. Um, so And it really changed around the second half. So I think that had a little bit to do uh, with that fact of where the fouls were called in the second half. I think a lot of people were shocked that there was an over-the-back foul called on Kansas late in regulation where Oklahoma had a chance to win it at the free throw line but the guy missed the, the free throw. There were people shocked that Kansas would get called at the end of a game in, in Allen Fieldhouse a, a foul like that. Uh, what is your best technical foul? Have you ever gotten a technical foul? What's your best technical foul story? Well, it was, it was actually funny. I, I was talking about this last night with my wife because we were watching the game and uh, I've only had one. one. And, and I said I couldn't remember what happened and my wife said, you shouldn't remember because nothing happened. You didn't deserve the technical. So, you know, to be honest with you, I really don't remember what I said or what I did, but I think it was something really minimal. Um, but I've only had one in my career, and hopefully I want to keep it that way. Have you ever seen an assistant coach get a technical foul? Yes, I, I did see an assistant coach on my staff when I was in Indiana State. He got a technical foul. How many laps did he have to run? Well, I'll tell you what, he didn't have to run any laps, but um, at halftime, Coach Waldman, who's a Bobby Knight disciple, okay, 
there were some choice words that were said to that assistant coach at that point in time, and I don't think there was any danger of him ever getting a technical foul again. You ever have a chance to sit down and talk motion offense or just basketball with Bobby Knight? Yeah, I actually did because, like I said, you know, Coach Waltman worked for Bobby Knight, um, and so we actually took a couple trips there uh, to Bloomington as a staff and got a chance to sit down and, and talk basketball. You know, Coach Knight, that barrier, that wall is, is really hard to break down, but uh, we actually had something in common. He grew up in Oroville, Ohio, and his mom was a grade school teacher, and my family is from Oroville, Ohio, and my mom actually was a student for uh, Coach Knight's uh, mom, and he remembered, you know, my raise, the raise, the family, and things like that. So it broke down that wall, so now he could actually have a real conversation with me. So he was actually in a good mood that day. Yeah, yeah, for once. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get Joel Angus coming up here. Uh, what uh, What can you tell us uh, about Joel? I, I I can't wait to ask him about what it was like growing up in Brooklyn. He's from Brooklyn. Uh, this is his fifth school in five years, so he has uh, he's moved around. He's he's had his bags packed, and uh, hopefully, you know, he's got uh, you know a home here at Southeast Missouri State. What can you tell us about coaching Joel Angus? Well, the first thing for me is like uh, he's the most mature student athlete I've ever coached. You know, if if we tell him to do something, it's done. If he's got something he needs to take care of academically, uh, anything as far as like housing, anything like that at all, it's already done. So. Uh, he's a young man that's really mature, goes about his business the right way off the court. Um, if you tell him something one time, it's done, and he remembers things. So, you know, he's a very bright young man. Um, he goes about his business the right way, so he's a pleasure to coach in that regard. But the other thing about it is, too, you know, you have some guys on the team who just want to be liked, and they're always going to say the, and do the right things. Well, Joel actually challenged a couple guys on the team as far as, like, doing things the right way and, and making sure that uh, he's trying to help the team. So I, I respect the fact that Joel is about doing his business the right way. But more importantly, he He's a guy that just wants to do things the right way, but he wants to win, too. And you can see it in the way he plays as far as, like, making the right decisions, making the right pass, because doing the right things all the time on the court doesn't necessarily lead to points for you. Sure. And, and so some guys won't do the right things because they want to have an opportunity to score the basketball. But sometimes he does the things that's hard to do, which is helping the team win by sacrificing some of the things for himself personally. How important is it to have an enforcer? That may not be the, the right word. A leader, somebody who will hold other teammates accountable, guys who have that respect, not fake tough guys. You know what I'm talking about. How important is it to have a guy like that on a team? What's well, interesting you would ask that I was listening to Charles Barkley on uh, radio about the Odell Beckham situation um, with against the Carolina Panthers. And and he was the, uh, the team that was actually interviewing him um, criticized the coaching staff for not dealing with Odell Beckham. And he says, like, that's not on the coaches. He says that's on his teammates. He says, like, coaches can only do so much as far as, like, reining in somebody that may have a problem or is going wayward. He said when it's all said and done, he says, like, you need guys on the team to police themselves. And, and so, like, you know, having those stories about that as far as, like, the teams being able to discipline themselves and police themselves – Having somebody on your team that's doing the same things and doing the right things when the coaches are not around is the most important thing. I, I tell you a quick story now. Ray Lewis, when he was with the Baltimore Ravens, and they were interviewing uh, one of the former – it was a former head coach there um, that does Brian radio Billick. now. Brian Billick. Yeah. Brian Billick said they had a curfew situation. And so during game, uh, camp, you had to be in by midnight. Well, they let the veterans stay at home. And so they didn't have to be there at camp, so they could actually go home every day. And he said the only one rule that they had was if there was ever any sort of a curfew violation, then the veterans had to come back and stay at camp. <laughs> and he says, like, you know, and the one rule along with that, if you're the guy who breaks the curfew, you have to go to Ray Lewis at his home, knock on his door, and tell him that he's got to come back and stay at camp because I was the one who broke curfew. He said they never had any curfew violations. No doubt. Good story. <laughs> All right. Let's take a time out. We'll talk with uh, Joel Angus. When we come back, we're at Wings, et cetera, in Jackson, the Cofeld Distributing Red Hawks Coaches Show with Coach Rick Ray.
are hungry more than that they're hangry and it's 95 degrees out and they're thirsty that's right people are thrangry they need to chill and that gives you an idea you remember Coors Light is filtered and bottled cold so you pass some cold ones out suddenly it's like they're snowboarding the majestic Rocky Mountains speeding away from the peaks of thrangry and down the slopes of all oh, yes so they make with the cheering and let you get with the grilling well done now it's time for your Coors Light <sighs> Coors Brewing Company Golden Colorado great beer great responsibility the conversation has been growing about Wings Etc. See, Wings Etc. has those award-winning jumbo wings. They're popular for both dine-in and carry-out. Now the word is getting out about Wings Etc.'s appetizer lineup. From the ultimate nachos to the deep-fried pickle spears, frankly, they're irresistible. Friends are sharing time together at Wings Etc. They've got dining rooms filled with HDTVs tuned to the best sports programming, including NFL Sunday Ticket. The people at the next table are talking about Wings Etc.'s daily half-pound lunch special, starting at just $6.49. Plus, Wings Etc. has food and drink specials throughout the week, including 59-cent wings every Monday. Plus, there's the kids' menu, and Wings Etc. is family-friendly with video games in the dining room. And the whole community is excited about how Wings Etc. is locally owned and operated, and they're proud to support local athletes, their families, schools, and teams. I guess Wings Etc. is a really big deal around here. There are lots of reasons to love the holidays. And now, during the Ford Holiday Sales Event, America's best-selling brand is giving you more. Big holiday savings on amazing vehicles, including built for tough trucks, cars that thrill by design, and SUVs that will help you be unstoppable. All with the technology, performance, and style you'll love. So don't miss the Ford Holiday Sales Event. Hurry to your Ford dealer for the best gift ever. Claim based on 2014 calendar year sales data. And now, your ESPN Radio Network local local weather forecast. The National Weather Service calling for sunshine. A high of 41 today will dip to 27 tonight under clear skies. 44 sunshine tomorrow. Then showers likely Thursday afternoon with a high of 46. More rain likely Thursday night lingering into Friday with a high of 53. Saturday, another chance of rain and a high of 50. And right now, Sunday, partly sunny and only 34 degrees. You're up to date with the latest weather forecast. Breaking on the ESPN Radio Network. Well, dude, obviously. For the Saturday morning express, catch it every Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. On CBS. The Colfell Distributing Red Hawks Coaches Show. We are live at Wings, etc. in Jackson. Now, make a note on your calendar. We'll be back here in Jackson tomorrow. We'll be back in Cape in two weeks. So. Uh, and make a note all, as well, we're going to be here at 5 o'clock on Monday afternoon, Monday evening, with a special edition of the Coaches Show right here at Wings and Jackson on the eve of the national championship football game between the Alabama Crimson Tide and the Clemson Tigers. It is our SEMO ESPN birthday bash. We turn three this year, and so we are going to have a birthday bash. We're giving out tickets for people to attend. Uh, you can watch the national championship game. We've got prizes, and yes, yes, we have cake. They've got, uh, I don't believe they have, they probably have some sort of cake here at Wings, etc., but they've got food and drink specials throughout the week, including their 59-cent wings every Monday, their daily half-pound lunch specials, Start for just six forty nine. They have a kids menu. They are open seven days a week and late on the weekends because the games run late. It is Wings, etc., and we thank them for hosting the Red Hawks Coaches Show uh, with Coach Rick Ray. We're joined by Joel Angus, the Red Hawks junior forward. I, I saw you over there. Now, most everybody that we have on the show gets the wings. Did you go the wings route today? No, I didn't. I got a grilled chicken wrap with some French fries. How was it? It was great. All right. Do you put any sauce on it or you go straight chicken wrap? Just straight chicken wrap. All right. Yeah. There you go. Uh, less calories, uh, the straight chicken wrap, and uh, water to drink? Yes. All right. See, he's, he's playing it healthy. That's, that's about as healthy as it gets. Now, you are from Brooklyn, one of the five boroughs. Uh, I looked it up last night. A population about 2.6 million. So you are from the biggest metropolitan area of anybody, certainly on the basketball team. What was it like growing up in Brooklyn? It was it was great. I had a lot of fun. You know, I got a lot of childhood memories. And like compared to Cape Girardeau, you mean? 
Well, just what was it like? I mean, it's, it, <laughs> I, I wouldn't think it would be like Cape, but I haven't been to Brooklyn. All right. So, like, you want me to take you through, like, a typical day? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to take you through a day of high school. Like, okay. I'll get up around 7 o'clock and just make sure I'll leave the house by around 7.45, catch the 7.50 train, get to school. Now, when you say train, the subway. Yeah, the subway. Okay, subway. And I'll stop, get a bacon, egg, and cheese in the morning from the corner store. It's like a deli. Then I'll be in school all day. Then practice. And then back on the train, back home. All right. <laughs> so so how, how convenient uh, is the subway? It's very convenient. But sometimes it runs 24 hours, so it works pretty much. Yeah. Now you're talking about stopping on the corner deli, uh, the bodegas and the delis. And all of those uh, mom and pop restaurants, uh, boy, they have some of the best food in the country, some right? Of the greatest. What some of the, what are some of the delicacies uh, that people, if they're visiting Brooklyn, what what uh, what are some of the delicacies that they have to partake in? Well, you have to go to at least three pizza shops. Okay. Try out some different pizza, and I would say you have to go to the corner stores and get you like a sandwich, like a deli sandwich. And you got a favorite? Uh, boys had honey turkey. That's like the greatest. All right. They actually getting it in Snooks in about two weeks. So, oh, so you've, you, about that. you've already got it on reservation then. Yes, yeah. I do. <laughs> All right. So a little slice of Brooklyn right here in Cape Girardeau. So uh, do you have to be tough? I mean, when we think of Brooklyn, we think, boy, that's a, it's a, it's a tough place to be. You're tough if you're from Brooklyn. Is that the case? You got to be tough, but it's more like, like I play basketball. So like basketball players, like athletes in general, like they – you either athlete, a person that goes to school, or you're a quote unquote tough guy. So like I was, I fell in the athlete line. So you pretty much get respect regardless. Well, we hear some legendary stories about some terrific playground basketball in your neck of the woods. Yes, is that is that the case? Uh, tell us about uh, some of the playground basketball and some of the some of the stars uh, from Brooklyn that uh, you know. I know some of these guys hold the court all day long, right? Well, it's not like that. Like it was like that. I would say in the '80s, but like growing up, we would be in the park a long time. Like the morning, and we got the lights, so we could be in there all night. But like growing up, as far as high school, we kind of lost that culture, and that's that's like a big thing that's happening right now, because the AU, AU teams changed. What can you tell us about Putnam Science Academy? Putnam Science Academy. That was a great place. I mean, I went to school. The school is probably about 90% Turkish, Turkish kids and from Turkmenistan. And only the basketball team is from, like, New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey. So, like, that was the experience. And I keep in contact with a lot of those kids. And it was it was cool. Eating Turkish food, it's different. <laughs> they cook french fries with everything, like, french fries and rice. Like, <laughs> Really? That was, like, the only reliable thing because, like, they'll cook some – Ground beef and it just you just eat the rice and French fries. So you can't get a chicken wrap. No, 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 no chicken, no wrap. chicken <laughs> wrap. So you went to Marion High School. Uh, yes. You led them to their first regional title in twenty-seven years. Your junior year. No, I didn't go to Marion. You did not. That's in Illinois. All right, I got the I got the wrong I got the wrong. What was your What was your uh, What was your first high school? Uh, Bishop Lockman. There it is. Yes, Bishop Lockman. Yes. So you got Bishop Lockman, mm -hmm. Putnam Science. Mm -hmm. Then you go to uh, Monroe College. No, I went to Westchester Community College. Westchester, then Monroe. Yes. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, if I could read my own notes, attended Westchester as a freshman. Average 13 points. So then West uh, Westchester, then Monroe, then Southeast. That's five schools in five years. That's a lot of traveling and a meeting lot. a lot of people, right? Yeah, it's a lot. It was a lot of different schools. And it was just like every school was different. And as far as Westchester, I came back for my sophomore year, but they had like a, I'm gonna say conspiracy, not a conspiracy, but it was like a, what do you call it? The NCAA violation, oh, okay. NJCAA violation. And unfortunately, they canceled our season that year. So I left. You had no January. choice. Yeah, yeah, you had no choice but so, to go somewhere else. Yeah. So I ended up going to Monroe College. Well, so it's boy. Most people hate moving, packing, yeah. packing everything up and moving. You've had to do it a lot. Yeah. Uh, 
when I look at it like that, I used to like not like, like I'm like, oh man, I got to go somewhere else. Like it's only one year, one year, one year. But I, I viewed it as like it's like a blessing in disguise. I get to meet a lot of different people, and I get to experience a, a lot of different things in my four year, four years of college and high school. So that's why I see that. All right, tell us about uh, Southeast recruiting you from Monroe College. Well, first I was hearing from the original staff, the original staff coach, Coach Nutt, Harrison, Coach Rosser, and I heard from them when we was in Hutch. Hutch is a national tournament for JUCO, right? And then about two weeks after, when Coach Ray got the job and he was settling in, he's, I spoke to him on the phone when he was driving from Mississippi, coming back to Southeast Missouri. And we just kind of built a relationship. I started speaking to him on the regular. And Coach Rosser, I knew him from the old staff. Then I came on a visit, and I enjoyed it. And about a week and a half, two weeks after, I committed. Playing a pretty nice building now that they've done all the upgrades, huh? Yeah, it's real nice. I was looking forward to that. All right. So compared to uh, the digs that you had at Monroe College, compare that to the Show Me Center. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, at Monroe, we had we had a pretty nice gym, like yeah. for a junior college, but it's a different environment. It's like it's nice. What's the biggest <laughs> jump of going from junior college to Division One basketball for you? Uh, from junior college. I would say, well, just from school, from a school standpoint, just being away from home. This is my first time yeah. actually going away, away from home. And from a basketball standpoint, it's just learning, like, to pick your spots in the game. Like, in junior college, is less structure. So you could kind of get it and go. Like, but college, like, Division One, like, other teams have scouting reports. Like, they know your tendencies. So it's like, you got to just pick your spots and know where to, like, go. So would you say that there could be a lot more selfish play on the floor in junior college than at Division One level? Yes. <laughs> the guys are trying to get the, the eyes of scouts because yep. they want to go play Division One basketball, yep. right? Exactly. All right. Uh, what was the toughest thing about learning the motion offense, and had you, had you ever played in any type of a motion offense prior to coming to Southeast? I played in a flex offense in my first junior college. And has some similarities, but the motion offense is different. It just because it's more read and react. Like I was used to playing in offenses where it's like, you know, after you set the screen, you come here. But now it's after you set the screen, whether he comes off tight or if he comes off straight, you gotta come back. Like so that's the biggest difference. How many times early on, uh, early in practice, before you guys played games, or even maybe even after the first couple of games, are you guys trying to learn the offense, run the offense, and all of a sudden somebody does something and Coach Ray says, stop it, shut it down. What happened right here? Uh, in the summertime, like, if, if we could have recorded those practices, <laughs> the two hours, like, you would, it's a whole different ball game. Like, we didn't understand, like, just – the re and reacting part of it, and it just looked like how do I explain? It was just Ch it, chaos, chaos. Yeah. It, but we, it's a bigger picture, and once we got it all, like all five of us on the court, it, it came together. All right, you, you, obviously the offense is getting better now. Are you starting to feel more comfortable? Are you seeing other guys starting to become more comfortable because the offense, the numbers can't lie. And you're playing good opposition. You you may you know you playing the two teams in the last week that have the most wins in the league. Are you starting to feel more comfortable, and are you feeling that other guys are starting to play more comfortable? Yes, I, I'm starting to feel more comfortable on the court, and I feel like my teammates are. And like when we talk amongst ourselves, like we tell each other that we all have to produce, so we got to be confident, and we want everybody to be aggressive. So if you're open, we need you to take that shot. And as you see, like Eric Miguel, he's starting to take a lot more shots. And we knew he could do this because we've been playing with him in pickups since the summertime. So it's just about him being confident in himself and everybody being confident and just being aggressive. You know, we've asked a few guys this about free throw shooting. You have been one of the best free throw shooters. When was the last time you were picked to shoot technical foul free throws for your team? Oh, I don't think I was ever picked. That's the first time <laughs> in your life you've been picked to shoot technical foul free throws. So that speaks well for you. Uh, we asked some of the guys uh, when they talk about free throws because Coach Ray says, hey, man, they're going in practice. 
How much of a, a mental thing is uh, the free throw part of the game? I think it's all mental, really, because you just got to focus and have a have the rhythm, a rhythm and confidence when you go to the line and just try to do the same thing every time. And you give yourself a good chance to make the free throws. You see any of that Kansas Oklahoma game last night? Yes. Okay. I just kept thinking that third overtime, everybody's legs have to be dead. These guys have to be exhausted. Mm -hmm. I thought Kansas was going to go up there and miss free throws, but they went up there and they made, they made free throws. For someone who has not been through a 40 minute Division One game and the fatigue that sets in, and then you have to go to the free throw line late as a tired athlete. Compare and contrast how it is to shoot a free throw, you know, in the opening 10 minutes of a game versus the final two minutes of a hard fought game. Well, it's a big difference because especially down the stretch of the game, some people might be thinking about the score. We got to tie it up. And then so it's all of those things and fatigue. So it's the contrast is like the what goes through your mind when you're up there uh, at the free throw line in a close game late. In the close game, I, I try not to look at the score. Okay. I try to just do my routine, calm down, breathe, and just say I'm going to make these free throws. All right. If you had to make an argument, the biggest, toughest, roughest team in the league mm -hmm. is Moorhead State. That's a team you're going to play Thursday. Traditionally, since Sean Woods has been there, even when Donnie Tyndall was there, mm -hmm. they are physical. They're one of the best rebounding teams in the league. They're one of the best defensive teams in the league. Does that get you, as a front court guy who's going to be banging down there on the post with some of these guys, does that get you a little bit more energized? Yes, it does. Like, I, I know we got to match their physicality, but it's like, yeah. Like, it. Belmont wasn't as physical as Tennessee State was, right? No, it yeah. wasn't. So it's going to be, I would say, a similar game, probably defensively, to what you, fought, what, uh, what you saw with Tennessee State. Which kind of a game do you prefer? I prefer the Tennessee State game. I actually like when teams like pressure you and do all the antics. Like I like that. All right, it, uh, it was fun. What what, uh, what was the guy's name the other night that kept talking to the crowd? Tajir McCall, number five. Did you see him uh, talking with the crowd? Yeah, I did. Yeah, he had a little flair. You are completely the opposite of of McCall, right? I I, I don't see a lot of that from you. You're you're kind of you're you're kind of more low key. Yeah, I'm low key. So. <laughs> All right, I know you're on Twitter. I know you're on Twitter because I, I looked you up before the before the show to make sure that you're on Twitter. Give everybody your your Twitter handle. My Twitter handle is at underscore Joe Cash. Yeah, spell that. J O E C A S H. Joe Cash. Yes. Okay, there it is. <laughs> underscore at Joe Cash. We'll see if we get you a couple of Twitter follows. Thanks so much, Joel. It was a pleasure uh, to talk to you today, and uh, good luck at practice today. I know you got to you got to head over for practice. All right, appreciate thanks. it. All right, Thank you. that's Joel Angus. We will get some final thoughts from Coach Rick Ray about the Moorhead State Eagles and the Eastern Kentucky Colonels coming up. It's the Colfeld Distributing Red Hawks Coaches Show from Wings in Jackson. See, Wings Etc. has those award-winning jumbo wings. They're popular for both dine-in and carry-out. Now, the word is getting out about Wings Etc.'s appetizer lineup. From the ultimate nachos to the deep-fried pickle spears, frankly, they're irresistible. Friends are sharing time together at Wings Etc. They've got dining rooms filled with HD TVs tuned to the best sports programming, including NFL. Bell Sunday tickets. The people at the next table are talking about Wings Etc.'s daily half pound lunch special starting at just $6.49. Plus, Wings Etc. has food and drink specials throughout the week, including 59 cent wings every Monday. Plus, there's the kids menu, and Wings Etc. is family friendly with video games in the dining room. And the whole community is excited about how Wings Etc. is locally owned and operated, and they're proud to support local athletes, their families, schools, and teams. I guess Wings Etc. is a really big deal around here. And now, your ESPN Radio Network local local weather forecast. The National Weather Service calling for sunshine, a high of 41 today. We'll dip to 27 tonight under clear skies. 44 sunshine tomorrow, then showers likely Thursday afternoon with a high of 46. More rain likely Thursday night, lingering into Friday with a high of 53. Saturday, another chance of rain and a high of 50. And right now, Sunday, partly sunny and only 34 degrees. You're up to date with the latest weather forecast. Breaking on the ESPN Radio Network. This is your local home for Mike and Mike, the sports huddle. And 
and all your favorite teams. Get it all right this here makes my day go great. on the SEMO ESPN Sports Network. Cole Feld Distributing Red Hawks Coaches Show at Wings, etc. in Jackson. We'll be back in Jackson next week. Coach Rick Ray is here. I want to get uh, some thoughts here real quickly on the two teams that you're playing. Uh, completely different teams. Moorhead State uh, is not going to score 83 points a game very often, which is what Eastern Kentucky scores. Uh, that's number one in the league. But Moorhead State, right about 68 per game. Uh, but you're talking about the number two rebounding team in the league and the number uh, four-ranked field goal percent defense, number one scoring defense. This is a team that, that wants to make it a knockdown drag out. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, there's no question about it. it, it it's going to be a fist fight. Um, they, they're going to be very formidable as far as like them, their physicality. Um, you know, I think the thing that's different about them too, with Moorhead state is they don't have a lot of size. Um, but what they have in that size is toughness. Um, so you're going to see guys are similar to our team, like a, a Trey Kellum and a Joel Angus, you know, guys who are not 16 or 69, but strong physical guys that don't mind using throwing bodies around and things like that. It's interesting because even though they're the second leading rebounding team in, as far as rebounding differential, they only have one guy in the top 20 in rebounding, and that is Dewan Marrero, who's 6'6", 230. Uh, it's kind of a collective effort from these guys. There's not a dominant rebounder like they used to have. Kenneth Fareed led the nation in rebounding. They've you know, Billy Reeder the last couple of years, big rebounder. They really don't have that guy this year, but as a team, Man, they can hit the glass. Yeah, you, what you have is you have some of their guards who are really good rebounders that's crashing in and getting those. Um, but the, it's a team collective a effort. You know, we like to talk about gang rebounding. It means all five, you know, have to rebound the basketball. And that's the mindset that they have. And, you know, it's funny, Dewan Marrero is actually from uh, East Chicago, um, Indiana, right in that Gary, Indiana area. And I remember going to watch him play when I was at Purdue when he was in the eighth grade. Um, so, really? yeah, he, he's a guy that uh, I think he eventually ended up going into Paul first, uh, then went to a junior college, right. and then now is over at Moorhead State. But uh, it's just weird how things work out. But, uh, you know, it's amazing that we were watching kids play at Purdue when they were in the eighth and the seventh grade. It's interesting also, they, only two teams have made fewer three-pointers in the league than them, but they're the third most accurate three. When they shoot them, they go in. So you wouldn't call them a prolific three-point shooting teams in terms of volume, like you'll see on Saturday with Eastern Kentucky, but they're accurate shooters from three-point range. Yeah, they put so much pressure on you with their dribble drive ability. They're, they're a team that wants to attack the paint off the bounce. And so when they do finally kick the ball out, they're usually uncontested threes because you've helped so many times on that dribble drive. They run a John Calipari back in the day, uh, Kentucky dribble drive motion. And what they do is just a penetration, penetration, penetration. And all of a sudden your defense breaks down. And when they do take that three, that guy is wide open. I'm sure you remember their top player, Corbin Collins, uh, he spent a year at LSU. So you're talking about an SEC athlete here, uh, 6'3", 190, uh, 20th in the league in scoring, 13th in steals, 14th in made threes. He does a little bit of everything. Yeah, he's a complete player. You know, he, he's a guy that can make a three. That's not what he wants to do. But if he's wide open, he can definitely knock down that shot. Um, but he's a guy that can really get into the paint. And once he gets into the paint, not only can he shoot a pull up, he can finish at the rim, but he really does a good job of finding open people. So he's constantly putting that pressure on your defense with his ability to get into the paint. And then you go to Eastern Kentucky, and that's a totally different uh, type of offense that they run there. And they really, really shoot a volume of three-pointers like Belmont does. Yeah, and I think that I'm not positive about this, but I think they may even shoot more uh, three-point attempts per game yes. than, than Belmont. I think Belmont is more accurate. Um, but, uh, you know, Eastern Kentucky, I haven't had a chance to watch a lot of them yet. Um, but they're there, you know, that coach there, Coach McHale is a Rick Patino uh, disciple and they're going to get out and they're going to press and they want to make you turn the basketball over. And they want to play up tempo style. Um, so they want to get a, get out, shoot threes and really put pressure on you as far as like their ability to spread the court. And their leading scorer, Jarrell Rochelle, that's his name. Jarrell Rochelle is the only player in college basketball with 300 points, 100 rebounds and 50 assists. Only guy in the country. Good player. 
yeah, that, that thing, those statistics mean that you're a really good basketball player. I wasn't aware of that. That's really phenomenal that he's putting up stats like that. Yeah, and he's, uh, he's a transfer as well, I believe, from Rhode Island. So I uh, he didn't do a whole lot there. He's kind of I don't know if you'd call him a buddy. He uh, the the thing is with the the Oklahoma kid, uh, would you c- compare him to Frank Kaminsky? I mean, he was really had he was kind of pedestrian his first few years, and all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden he's a he's a guy that is probably in the discussion for National Player of the Year. Yeah, I think one thing that y- you must do is you got to use guys like Frank Kaminsky as teaching tools for your players. You know, sometimes like guys get frustrated with their playing time as freshmen, you know, the productivity as freshmen. And now one of the teaching tools that you have is you'll go and you'll pull up Frank Kaminsky stats as a freshman. I mean, he averaged 1.6 points per game as a freshman, but that was a guy that didn't like give up on it, didn't transfer, didn't even complain about his playing time. What he did was work on his game and got better. So you talk about a guy who scored 1.6 points per game as a freshman that ends up being player of the year in college basketball. You know, just the perseverance and showing guys they got to stick with it and work on their game. Five o'clock and one o'clock, the start times, Thursday and Saturday. Uh, do you like playing before the women? Uh, this is, will be the third time in four conference games that you play first and then the women play. Does it matter to you? Well, it does to me because it lets us get in our routine. Sometimes when you play a double hitter and you play in the second game, you might get 20 minutes to warm up. You might get 25 minutes to warm up. You might get 30, depending on the length of the game. But when you play first, you have your chance to get into the routine where you get on the court, you know, 65 minutes before the game. And Coach Johnson, our strength coach, is able to warm those guys up and they get to shoot. They come back into the locker room. So the routine part of it is ideal to me. Um, so I like playing first just because of that reason. And hang around and wait for the other game to get over with. It's like we're at Northern Kentucky and you you predicted it. Watch them go into overtime, Northern <laughs> Kentucky and, and Akron. And here they go in overtime. So you guys are just sitting in the hallway waiting. Yeah, and so what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your guys prepared to go out and play and warming up and, and the recovery and all those types of things. And so, like, when it's set, you know you're playing at 5 o'clock or you know you're playing at 7 o'clock, then you can really go out and get your guys ready for to compete the optimum performance. Well, you've already logged 4,500 miles in travel miles. This 742 miles on the bus uh, over the next four days. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I tell you what, for our guys who are so long, you know, everybody, you know, I struggle sometimes on the bus and I'm, I'm just 6'3", you know, and some of our other guys. So we worry about that. We try to stop. We try to make sure we treat their bodies right, get them plenty of water. Um, but just, you know, the biggest part of recovery is really just hydrating yourself and, and sleeping. So we want to make sure we're doing those two things even on the bus. They do a good job of sleeping on the bus. Yeah, they do a great job of sleeping <laughs> on the bus. They do a great job of sleeping at home they do a great job of sleeping all the time they're great at that they're they're all conference sleepers coach thanks so much and uh, we'll see you thursday in moorhead kentucky thank you very much that's coach rick ray that's going to do it here the red hawks coaches show we'll get you back into espn radio programming we'll be here again uh next monday at wings etc in jackson so long everybody